The session is entitled The New Jerusalem. The passages for this week's session give us a climactic vision of the end of all things, the ultimate coming of God's kingdom, revealing the final outcome of the conflict, judgment, and destruction that have permeated previous chapters of the book of Revelation. They serve as a fitting end to the entire canon of scripture or Bible. John the Revelator's description of what heaven, or ultimate destination, will be like is very brief. Nonetheless, its conciseness and focus tell us all we need to know in order to keep faith with God's purposes. Specifically, this celestial vision is about newness, a new heaven and a new earth, verse 1, the new Jerusalem, verse 2. I am making everything new, verse 5. The world which is old and which we are used to by virtue of our living in it will give way to a new and different place. Will this new dwelling place be anything like our current dwelling place or will it be completely different? None of us can know for sure, but the language of earth and the imagery of Jerusalem suggests it could very well be a renovated and rejuvenated earth as we know it. Even so, it will be qualitatively, substantively new. Two Old Testament river stories would have been in the mind of John the Revelator as he wrote about the river of the water of life. Genesis chapter 2 describing the river flowing through Eden, watering the garden there, and Ezekiel 47 describing a river of water coming out from under the temple. Both passages also refer to trees, very similar to the tree of life, whose ultimate purpose is finally revealed for the healing of the nations. But I wanted to give as a starting point, the idea of the river of life, the tree of life, the river, and I thought of some songs that focus on the river. And there are two that use the same tune, and I have not researched this before, and it hadn't dawned on me that they both use the same tune until this morning. Shall we gather at the river? Yes, there flows a wondrous river, and the tune is called Shall We Gather at the River. Again, I wanted to focus on the idea of the river, because one of the things that we see in the passage is the contrast of river and sea. And the sea is viewed as being turbulent and rough, and the river is viewed as being celestial and glassy and shining and all kinds of positive things. Of course, the rivers can be raging too, but the idea of the river that is given in scripture is something that's far more peaceful. And a river passes between two portions of land, whereas the sea can go on and on and on, and it can lead to, my grandmother used to say, the sea has no back door, <laughs> which means that you could go into the sea and never come out. Whereas a river, you normally think of rivers that are under control at some level, except when there's a heavy rainstorm and the river gets to rise above its uh, crest level and does that dangerous and damaging thing. But normally when you think of a river, you think of something that is more controlled. When you think of a sea, you think of something that you have less control over. So the authors, and it's Robert Lowry and Richard Slater, focusing on the river and using the same tune. So that means that the metric is the same. One of them says, shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing from the throne of God. The throne of God comes up in the passage. So I think this is a better fit than the second song. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. The scripture passage says it flows from the throne of God, but Lowry says flows by the throne of God. On the margin, the bank, on the margin of the river, dashing up its silver spray, we will walk and worship ever all the happy golden day. Verse 3 says, ere or before, ere we reach the shiny river, lay we every burden down, grace or spirits will deliver, and provide a robe and crown. Last verse it says, at the shining of the river, mirror of the Savior's face. And I never noticed that before. At the shining of the river, mirror of the Savior's face, saints whom death will never sever raise their song of saving grace. I want to pause and think about that for a moment. The river mirrors the Savior's face. The second song more talks about coming to Christ. Yes, there flows a wondrous river that can make the foulest clean. To the soul, it is the giver of the freedom from all sin. So the idea of cleansing from sin comes up in this second song, which seems to focus on coming to the river as opposed to gathering at the river. The chorus says, round us, 
flows the cleansing river. I like how Slater describes the river. He says, the holy, mighty, wonder-working river that can make a saint of a sinner, it flows from the throne of God. So he does say, from the throne of God, which is what the passage says, as opposed to by the throne of God. So that was my starting point to try and get my idea on the river. There's a one little song I looked at that talks about the Crystal River. So I guess it's, it's a shiny river, the Crystal River. It's a good idea here. All right, so I do have the scripture passage, chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, or 5a, and then chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Chapter 21 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. And the second passage is called Eden Restored or the Garden Restored. Chapter 22, 1 through 4 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of a great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. In the Old Testament understanding, Moses was asked to establish a tabernacle among the people, and the tabernacle moved with the people as they moved along. So you could say that in the Exodus story, the tabernacle dwelt among the people. So Revelation is looking to say the tabernacle is going to dwell among the people. He will dwell with them. He will, they will be his people. So I guess I'm going to ask for thoughts on the idea of the tabernacle dwelling among the people when they left Egypt and certainly until Solomon built the temple the tabernacle was located physically somewhere last week we said it was located at Shiloh and then when David became king it moved to Jerusalem so it's physically identifying in a certain location which would be farther away from the tribes that are at a distance and closely located with those who are obviously in that geography. I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed, a loud voice saying, look, God's tabernacle is now among the people, and he will dwell with it. So we get a sense of a gathering, a reassembling, so we may be all over the place now, but we will be brought back into a new place, a presence so that while we talk now about the Holy Spirit dwelling with us in various locales and <laughs> in, our, in us, we are going to be in his presence and it's going to reform. It's kind of like come, a homecoming. It will be a great homecoming where we will be in the presence of God. His dwelling place is among the people. He will dwell with them. Clearly that's something that we look forward to. I certainly look forward to that. I think our hope we sing the songs about it. Our home is in heaven. There will be no parting. All will be happy, the song says. So we want to get that sense that we are in the place with God as opposed to longing to be with him. And I think that's what all of us look forward to. Jesus says that as he tells his disciples before he is crucified. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself so that you can be with me. So there's that sense of we want to be with him. We want to be in the presence of God. We want his dwelling place to be 
in our presence, in our midst, as opposed to where we are now, where there are these competing forces, you know, there's the world and the flesh and the enemy and all things working in a world surrounded by temptation, sin, and all kinds of ugliness. We want to be removed from that. And as we are regathered, we're gathered to what John says is a new heaven and a new earth. The commentary for today says, John sees the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It is not a replacement Jerusalem, as if the old one is done away with. Rather, like we saw in the new heaven and new earth, this new Jerusalem is a fulfillment of all of Jerusalem's hopes and dreams. Salvation has finally come for Zion. This heavenly Jerusalem is the fulfillment of all God's hopes and dreams for the city. It is called the holy city and it comes down from God adorned as a bride. The intimacy that God has desired to have with Jerusalem through the ages has finally come to fulfillment. Continuing, it says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. What I like about this is that, I guess you can think of the song saying that all will be happy, glorious, bright and fair, there will be no sorrow. My home is in heaven, there is no part in there. All will be happy, glorious, bright and fair, there will be no sorrow. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. So there is a clear sense and the question is why is John saying this or writing this in this vision? I think that we already kind of knew this, but in the vision he is getting this sense of this is what the new thing will be like. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. Wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is, I think, the sense of a permanence now. No more. There's a permanence now. You will live forever. As the scriptures say when Paul writes in Corinthians, you'll be forever with the Lord. There'll be no more death and no more crying and no more pain. The old order of things has passed away. Let's see what the commentators did with that. John heard a loud voice from the throne declaring that God had taken up residence among the people. The NIV's dwelling translates the same word that John's gospel uses to talk about the enfleshed word dwelling or tabernacling with us. John 1, 14. He beheld his glory. Anyway, the goal since the beginning of creation, God's presence and communion with creation is now brought to bear in the new creation. God will be with the people, and the people will be with God. Full communion and with humanity and with all creation has been perfectly restored. As a result, all the tears from the ages of sin and its consequences for humans and the earth will be wiped away, and the people will be consoled by God. Similarly, because creation has been perfectly renewed, death is no more, along with crying, pain, and mourning. Those all belong to the old order of creation under sin, God's victory over sin and death, and the forces that oppose God in creation has brought a decisive end to that old order. And here is where, I'm not going to be controversial, but I'm going to tell you that I've always wondered why God ordained it to be the way he ordained it. Because from the time that Adam and Eve did what they did, he could have fixed it. He could have made it right. In other words, what is happening with Jesus coming and then thousands of years between Jesus coming and the second coming. All of that in God's calculus is like next to no time because he is outside of time. Why all of this time for all of this extra stuff to happen? There's going to be an end and there obviously there's no more after that. Why, why the delay? It's a, a mystery to me. Why have a certain period of time, thousands and thousands of years, for sin to rule the world, for the enemy to get some control or seeming control, and then God will crush the enemy. Yeah, that's the mystery. A mystery that one day I will understand, but I don't know how other people think that through. Because a lot of unpleasantness is going to happen. There are people who are going to live who are going to reject God. There are people who are going to have suffering. And at the end, when this, at the second coming, all of that will be done with. So there'll be no more of that. There'll be no more generations that go through those cycles of unpleasantness. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
why the length of time between when Adam and Eve did what they did until when the second coming occurs do we have all of this suffering and unpleasantness and what goes on I don't know a lot of striving a lot of destruction of God's creation in the process a lot of political <laughs> fighting a lot of ugliness in the world so that's been my question perennial question from childhood why why allow all of this to happen partly because I was raised with the idea that he come at any moment you're saying come on <laughs> come on Lord end it now so that there wouldn't be all this suffering and then you see suffering if you see suffering in your family and among your loved ones you're saying gee you know why is this necessary now if you say that everybody has to die I didn't get that but if he's going to come at a time and rapture thus you know why all the suffering why does suffering need to take place you want the what the passage talks about to happen but you know that between then the beginning and now there's a lot of suffering you know that between the time Christ came and now there are lots of people who will not accept Christ in my own way of being raised there'll be people who will accept Christ and then reject Christ it just seems like a mystery and I don't know if anyone has any greater clarity than I, which is part of the reason I say, you know what, it's kind of like being told to do a job. You don't argue about why other people aren't doing this job or why other people have a more pleasant job. You just do the best you can where you are and look forward to the end. But it's a mystery. It has always been for me. And uh, I wish that there was greater clarity on it. Verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. You want to know that there is a sense of order. And I wish that there could be a promise that when you, and there isn't, that when you live life according to God's ordi ordinance, His ordination, that your life would actually go peacefully so that you get away from some of the unpleasantness. I think it's Annie Johnson Flint who wrote the song, says he doesn't promise skies always blue, flowers strewn pathways all our lives through. He doesn't promise sun without rain, joy without sorrow, and peace without pain. He doesn't tell us we shall not know toil and temptation, trouble and woe. He doesn't tell us we shall not bear many a burden, many a care. But I wish that some of that was part of the deal, you know, that when you become a Christian, that life physically gets better if that were the case then you know lots of people would accept Christ but because there's no guarantee of that they say well you know I'm not exactly sure what I should do about this I participated in a family funeral yesterday and uh, it was a spouse of a relative and the pastor was saying that on his deathbed he accepted Christ and I was so happy to hear that in the, in the past month before he died, he accepted Christ. And I wish that it hadn't been like that, that he would have cooperated with his family all along and done the right thing. It's good that he did the right thing, but it would have been nice to know that things were going smoothly for them all along as opposed to this struggle. And when he is sick and dying, then he makes a decision for, for Christ. That's a good thing, as I said. But you don't want your life to be so filled with pain and struggle and other things. You want to know that life will be smoother, but I guess there's no promise of smooth. That's what Andy Johnson Flint saw and other writers have said. There's no promise of that. The promise is that he'll give you strength and help and guidance and all that kind of stuff. What will it be like to live in the continuous presence of God? it's something I look forward to I anticipate it more than anything I've ever anticipated but I have no clear sense as to what it will be like and I know that you're going to ask the questions as I've heard a few weeks ago if your loved ones people you care about aren't there will that will you just like forget that will that be part of 
the anxiety and the pain and the sadness that is gone? Or will it be an awareness? What will it be like to live in the continuous presence of God? If you are self-oriented and you don't think about others, I don't know. So that's a good question. What would it be like to live in the presence? I mean, you could be very happy that things are going well, that you've done what you needed to do, but there must be that. I can't, ever since you mentioned it, Mary, I haven't stopped thinking about it, you know? <laughs> I haven't stopped thinking about it. Because I try to put out of my mind, like, denial is more than a river in Egypt, but if there are people who were important to you who are not there, what would it be like? I don't know. I'm sure the, the verse said that he will wipe away every tear from your eyes. <laughs> and maybe that's the comfort, that God will apply that solve that will make you not feel any more pain, no more crying. But even as I read it, I fully don't understand it. He will wipe away every tear from your eyes. There will be no more crying or pain. I think what is important to remember is that this is just a vision he had <laughs> at one point in time and he documented it so if it were like many versions or many uh what do you call it? episodes with greater clarity that would be good but it's one one vision so yeah if it's one vision in a short period of time <laughs> he's seeing a lot and he's trying to document that and i'm not sure Obviously, he's trying to do the best he can <laughs> to say, this is what I saw. They're just like, okay, I'm not ready for this. And people say, yeah, you need to read it. Like the people who say, read the Bible, uh, uh, the Bible in a year, I say, read it. I say, yeah, I read it, but I don't really get anything because when I read, I want to study. I have a hard time turning the page. So for me, I want to read to understand. And if I can't understand, I don't want to read because it's going to just hang out there in my head and this will hang out in my head for a long time too. But thankfully I have people who know the Bible and love the Bible who are with me here to talk this through. But it will still stay with me and I don't know it will be much clearer on it. I'm going to go to the second passage because we probably have a couple of minutes left. And, okay, so chapter 22. I actually like this one a little more. <laughs> the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of a great street of the city. What I like about that, I mean, when you think of a river, you think like a street. This is a good analogy. But then he does this in the, in the continuation. He says, on each side of the river stood the tree of life. It's like saying there's a house on both sides of the street. There's no way that unless it's spanning the street, like you know, <laughs> you've cut out under a mountain. And I guess I thought about that for the first time now, like a mountain. A mountain, you can have a tunnel through the mountain so the street can run through the tunnel, through the mountain. But how does a river run through a tree? The tree of life is on both sides of the river. Obviously I'm focusing on the minor details here, but it's fascinating to me. But it's saying this tree is bearing crops of fruit. Again, hard for me to grasp. Yield it, eat its fruit every month. Now does this mean the 12 is important to the 12 months because they weren't using our calendar? <laughs> Why is he mentioning months? Bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Does this mean that, how do you understand that? The tree is always bearing fruit and they always have 12 crops of fruit? Or there's one crop of fruit in one month and another crop of fruit. It can be because they didn't have the same idea of, well, I don't know if they had the same idea of months. Okay, so the Sunday School Commentary says, the river flows through the middle of a great street in the city. In this case, something like a boulevard may be pictured here. It can be difficult to picture this literally, and the literal is probably not John's primary purpose here. John's vision communicates the theological reality of the goal of history through the power of image. The Greek itself is ambiguous about whether the river flows through the middle of the street or whether the tree of life is between the street and the river. The point is that the river's source is the God at the heart of the universe and the Lamb, and that its 
Life giving flow runs through the city. I think I agree with that. The tree of life is another aspect where the literal picture can be challenging. John reports that on either side of the river, he saw the tree of life, singular. Did he see one tree or two? He seems to suggest two trees, but the noun is singular. One explanation is that he saw two trees, but they were both the tree of life, in contrast to Genesis 2.9, where the tree of life stood alongside the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The second tree was this, the cause of humanity's downfall and the pollution of creation by sin and death. In the new creation, both trees are the tree of life. And there is no possibility of sin's reemergence. Amen to that. Regardless of the challenges of picturing literally what John saw, on the theological level, the tree of life next to the river recalls the paradise of God's original creation, showing that all things have truly been made right. The tree of life that John saw produces 12 kinds of fruit each month. This could mean that all the kinds of fruit are yielded every month, or that there is one kind of fruit for each month. The image portrays the abundance and the miraculous nature of the tree's provision of food. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I have my own thoughts about that. My grandmother used to use the leaves of trees for healing. <laughs> this echoes and expands Ezekiel's vision of the river flowing from the temple. The fact that the leaves serve as a healing of the nations might suggest that the restorative work of the new creation is an ongoing reality rather than an instant one. I don't get that. Certainly when one reads about the trauma throughout the book of Revelation, the necessity of a process of therapy and healing becomes clear. Don't get that either. That the healing is for the nations reinforces the universal nature of the new creation. This city is described in the language of the Jewish prophets as and is a fulfillment of Israel's narrative but it is open also to every tribe and people a language and nation yeah you would figure that if all things are made new it's made new instantaneously as opposed to ongoing I like to think of the water doing more than that <laughs> health and strength because if, it, if you are restored already why do you need the water to provide anything like that? My last comment will be related to my cut and paste from Wikipedia. I looked up River of Life and it says, the use of the term Water of Life in Revelation 20 is part of the theme of life in the book of Revelation. Other instances being the Book of Life, the Tree of Life, and it relates to the theme of eternal life. And this is life eternal that we should know the the one true God, and him whom thou didst send, Jesus Christ. So all these references, I just look forward to it all coalescing in one. And uh, an ongoing relationship with God, forever and ever and ever. <laughs>